Access our online videos on Church of Christ and other Campbellite movements on Yahoo Video. Once on the Yahoo Videos homepage, put Larry Wessels in the search box and click enter. But we're glad you're here tonight, and it's been a real nice, spirited debate. And uh, these debates are not always uh, conducive to the best side of human nature, even if you have as good a human nature as David seems to have that we seems to think that we do have. But uh, nevertheless, it's been a good spirit, and I appreciate the church having us here, and you're tolerating a alien foreign voice such as mine saying some of the things that I say and I commend you for your enduring abilities along those lines. Uh, the proposition tonight as has been read, you did read that didn't you Mark, and I want to uh, flash on the board my uh, chart, the first one in the box I believe it is, is the questions uh, I want to get these before the audience, and you, you may look up on the board, and I'll read from my copies here to David Brown. It's true or false all the way down. Number six, I failed to uh, put the T or F, and Tom Wright, the moderator for Mr. Brown, called that to my attention. So all these are true or false. It is reasonable to depend on revelation rather than Thomas Warren's writings on logic and law of rationality. Number two, Tom Warren is a spiritual mastermind who preaches truth only, and I'm quoting here from the Spiritual Sword magazine where these claims were made. Number three, David Brown cannot produce documentation, written or oral, that Bob Ross teaches that the Holy Spirit personally contacts the heart of man without any medium whatsoever in the work of regeneration. Number four, David Brown rejects the experience of salvation claimed by Alexander Campbell, which I read from the Memoirs of Campbell, Volume 1, page 111, which took place before Campbell came to America and before he was baptized by a Baptist preacher in 1812. Number five, David Brown rejects the experience of special calling to salvation claimed by Thomas Campbell before he came to America and before he was baptized in 1812. Number six, David Brown believes that men such as the Campbells restored the Church of Christ without ever being baptized in order to obtain the remission of sin. Now, those are the questions, and we'll wait to see his answer concerning them. Now. He had a speech last evening, which was the last one of the night, and I did not get to answer or respond to that, and some of the things I did not have time to respond to even in earlier speeches. So out of respect to what he said, in order to get a comment upon those things, I'm going to try to mop up just quickly uh, those things he said in his last speech and whatever I failed to mention of any significance prior to that. First of all, on the matter of Saul, uh, David referred to the idea that Saul lived in all good conscience, and he quoted, I believe it was Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, if I remember correctly. Well, now, the implication that I got from what he was reading there was that Saul never did have a bad conscience that all his life he'd lived a good conscience, and I suppose David was trying to say that this said something about uh, the conscience of man in relation to the subject of depravity. Well, now, friends, in Acts chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, Paul said that he thought that, uh, or rather that he taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day, and I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Then in Acts 26, in verse 9, Paul said, I verily thought, I reasoned, maybe David, I thought within, with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Now, I could multiply such statements as this, from Paul, 
about where he persecuted the church of God. Now, is David trying to tell us that that interpretation of living in all good conscience meant that Paul had a good conscience when he was doing these things and that that good conscience meant that he didn't have any depravity or no sin or because Paul was living in good conscience it justified these things here? Well, I'm satisfied that Paul had a good conscience then, as Jesus said people would have, perhaps uh, John 16, verse 2, where he said they'll uh, persecute you, they'll kill you, and uh, they'll think they do God a service. Paul thought he was doing God a service. Jesus said here in John 16, 2, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Well, if you think you're doing God a service, you probably will have a good conscience. But what does that prove for his doctrine that denies the work of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the Word of God? Absolutely nothing. It just shows that he is so pressed for anything, for substance and argumentation, that he, he goes to extreme ideas here, there, and yon in his effort to find an answer. Now, Brown will probably leave this debate with a good conscience, uh, just like Paul left the stoning of Stephen with a good conscience, because he thinks he's doing everything exactly right. And he'll walk out of here with a good conscience, just like Paul walked away after he stoned Stephen or had a hand in it, and he, he, he walked away with a good conscience and thought that he'd done God a service. Now, uh, furthermore, he said, uh, I can't baptize you, Mr. Ross. Well, now, would you have baptized Alexander Campbell? My friend, Mr. Wilhite, whom I met here in the debate, the grandson of Porter Wilhite, who I communicated with years ago, Porter and I had a little jostling back and forth through the mail, and Porter told me that uh, Alexander Campbell had to convert a Baptist preacher in order to get baptized. And I said, well, Brother Porter, did you ever think about the fact that he could have just gone down to the local Church of Christ and had a, a Church of Christ preacher baptize him? Why didn't he do that? Well, the fact of the matter is there was not one around. That was the problem. And uh, so David, he said, I can't baptize you. I just wonder if he would have baptized Alexander Campbell and relieved that Baptist preacher of that job of baptizing. Now, if Alexander Campbell came up here tonight, he said, I deal with him just like I'm dealing with Ross. Then he would say, Alexander Campbell needed another baptism, wouldn't he? Because both of us were baptized by a Baptist preacher. Campbell was baptized by a Baptist preacher. Ross was baptized by a Baptist preacher. And David said he'd deal with Campbell just like he'd deal with Ross, and he told Ross that Ross needed to be baptized again. But you know a strange thing about it. They don't think Campbell needed another baptism. Campbell didn't think he needed another baptism, and they brag on him about restoring the church and doing all these things we read about in the Christian Worker magazine. All of it with a baptism it was administered by a Baptist preacher never in order to obtain the remission of his sins. Now, uh, we commented about what he said about the location of the Spirit being in heaven. I recommend you read Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10 on that, uh, just at your own convenience and study that out. He said, well, the third person of the Godhead spoke to Paul. He did. Is Acts a part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 55, 11, David? Now, we controverted a little bit there on Isaiah 55, 11. He said, where is the Holy Spirit in that verse of Scripture? He couldn't find the Holy Spirit in that verse of Scripture. That verse of Scripture says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, he said, the third person of the Godhead, which is, is it Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Is that your third person? The third person spoke to Paul. Now, David, it says here that the Word is going to accomplish and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Is the book of Acts part of the fulfillment of this? Sure it is. So there you have the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul and doing exactly what Isaiah 55, 11 said. It would accomplish the thing that God ordained. Now, he said, give us a demonstration of unction reasoning. Well, I'm giving you some during this debate. Of course, you don't believe there's any unction, so you don't believe I'm under any unction. I'm doing it 
and you're rejecting it, just like the Pharisees in the Bible rejected John the Baptist, rejected Jesus. You know, they came to Jesus, talked about John's baptism, and they reasoned within themselves, just like David's been reasoning within himself. They, they reason within themselves. If we say this, he'll say that. If we say the other, he'll say the other. And uh, they didn't have either way to go. They said, we cannot tell. And I asked him the other night about Campbell's baptism. Well, he cannot tell either. He can't tell either way because he's caught in a log jam. As I said, either way he turns, he falls into a ditch. So I'm giving him a demonstration of unction reasoning. He says, does Ross claim to know all things? In 1 John chapter 2, verses 20, he read that. Well, now, we could take that expression, all things, and answer him on the basis of that, but I won't do it that way. I'll just stick in the passage where he was. In verse 27, the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. David doesn't believe there's any anointing in anybody. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is true. And is true. Now, we don't need men like David and Thomas Warren teaching us from logic and reason because we have truth, David. Now, how much does he teach us? He teaches us of all things. Now, if because one had an unction of the Spirit, he immediately knew everything there was to know, John wouldn't even be writing his letter, would he? If he immediately knew everything there was to know in the mind of God, we wouldn't even need the Bible, would we? Of course not. There wouldn't need to be the writings of Paul and the writings of Peter, but even these two apostles, Paul said, we know in part. Peter said there's some things that Paul wrote were hard to be understood. So he's trying to stretch this word, all things, out to such an extreme that he thinks he can embarrass Ross because Ross believes that the Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmities with regard to understanding the truth. The Holy Spirit helps us. We're, called, we're, we're commanded to ask God for wisdom, and yet David claims uh, we already have it all in our minds, logical ability and rationality, so we don't need any help from God. And even if you ask God, friends, what's God going to do? David doesn't believe God helps anybody. How can he believe that God helps anybody when he believes the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything? He's off up in heaven. How could God help him? They told me one time in a debate I was having, they said, Brother, Mr. Ross, we're praying for you. I said, oh, well, I appreciate it. What are you asking God to do? They drew back. They said, oh, we're praying that you'll obey the truth. I said, no, we're, I'm asking you what did you ask God to do? You prayed to God. You didn't pray to me. What did you ask God to do? They said, oh, well, we just hope and pray that you'll obey the truth. I said, but tell me, what did you ask God to do? He said, well, not really anything. Well, you know why? They don't believe God does anything. He can't nudge you. He can't touch you. He can't indwell you. He can't come into you. Why, if he did that, you'd be out here raising the dead and doing miracles and writing Bibles and all that if he indwelt you, wouldn't he? According to David. You can't have that measure of faith, according to Romans 12, 3, that God deals to every man according to his will and purpose. In other words, if you're not an apostle or something, you have miraculous powers, you can't be indwelt with the Spirit. But look here. It says, He abideth in you. David said he's not in you. David even said he wasn't in the Word. He's not around. He's up in heaven, except for, oh, his omniscience, as David called it, his omniscience. But so far as any action or any work or any power, he's as far away as heaven, according to David Brown. He says, does Ross claim to know all things? Well, here it is right here, David. Ross knows as much as the teaching of all things is being imparted to Ross from this truth that is referred to here. He teacheth you of all things, all those things that pleases God for me to know and for you to know, if you are, of course, a believer. So where Christ taught, where did Christ teach about grammar and synecdoche and it's so important and so forth? Well, I don't know. He may have taught them. John said if we wrote everything he taught, the world couldn't contain the books. I don't know, David. There are some mathematical things in the Bible that's taught, but uh, I don't know that that has anything to do with what John's talking about here. If he does, you can logically deduct that, I'm sure, by following Tom Warren's advice. 
Now, some of these logicians go this far. I've got a book at home. The man says, God is logic. And that's what they want you actually to believe. And he's following man, Tom Warren, is just about in that predicament, the way he writes about logic. Now, simply because Mr. Brown does not have the spirit and the unction does not mean that no one else doesn't have it. I'm happy that with the, within the Church of Christ today, the overall movement, there is a move back to the Bible doctrine on the truth of the Spirit's indwelling. Up until the late 1960s, I never saw much evidence in the churches of Christ of spirituality according to as I understand spirituality. But through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, ladies and gentlemen, I have been amazed at how the Lord is working within the church of Christ. The doctrine of justification by faith is being revived. The doctrine of hermeneutics, that old hermeneutical system they've had, is being cast aside by many of them. Some of the doctrines that are known as Calvinism are rampant, as they say, in some of the churches of Christ. The Restoration history is being taught more candidly in some of the schools. Mark 16, 16 is fast losing that old standard interpretation it's had in the churches of Christ. That name doctrine is falling by the wayside in many places. Many men have changed, such as Ketcherside, Garrett, Hardin, Scott, Holt, Shelley, Bales, Jones, Anderson, Hook, Hodge, Thompson, and many more I could name here. Some brethren were here last night from Baytel who heard me debate Dobbs in 1968. And I guess they were all for the Church of Christ doctrine then, and they tell me they've changed. And so I'm really rejoicing. I had a letter come in the mail just yesterday, and I thought, well, I'll just blend this in with my speech. Listen to this. I know this is another Demas, another Demas. He said, Dear Mr. Ross, in the past I ordered your books about Campbellism and found them food for thought and a blessing. In fact, having been a member of the Church of Christ for 20 years, I'm now looking for a possible new church home. And then he goes on to tell me about his 17-year-old son who's been a preacher in the local Church of Christ, and he has decided not to pursue that anymore. And he's wanting to write an article about this experience. I, I'm, I tell you, miracles are happening, folks. Minor miracles, small miracles anyway, nothing to compare me with the raising of a dead body. But the churches of Christ across this country, I... I believe that maybe the next great spiritual awakening in America, of course, it's going to pass David by. He's not going to get in on the blessings. But the next great spiritual awakening in this country could very likely be among the churches of Christ. They're breaking out of the old cliches and slogans and patterns and balls and chains of restorationism, and they're going back to the Bible. I'm not saying that that facetiously either. I'm really impressed by what's going on in the churches of Christ. You see, we, don't, we as Baptists don't believe that everybody in the churches of Christ is lost like David believes everybody in the Baptist church is lost. We don't believe that. We believe that God's able to take His Word in any church or no church and bless it by the power of the Spirit and a man become a believer in Jesus Christ and be saved, just like Paul on the road to Damascus. Not necessarily that same experience, but the same essence of it, bowing to Jesus as Lord. Whether you're a Church of Christ, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, whatnot, God is not bound by these denominational walls and names and so-called scriptural patterns and all this stuff. God's not bound by that. How much time, Mark? Mr. Ross, gentlemen moderators, ladies and gentlemen, I again count it a pleasure to stand before you in the negative of the proposition that was read and never defined. It wasn't defined last evening, and as he said, it'll be a point in my favor. It's a point in my favor because he's signed to do something he won't do. I don't know why, and we're not going to let him forget. He has the unction. He doesn't like it, but he has the unction. He said he had the unction. He said, don't believe him unless he's quoted. We quoted him in his own words that the unction gave him to write, and he denies it now. And what are you going to believe? The Holy Spirit denied it when he wrote it. And so that's the situation that we have before us. We'll look more into this as we go on. But I want to notice, he said he's respi responding to Thursday night's lesson. Nothing new. Holy Spirit couldn't help him get through last night in the proper time, and so he takes up more time tonight. Now, why couldn't he last night? Funny spirit. Acts 23, verse 1, he said he gets on to me because I quote Luke's inspired record of what Paul said as an apostle inspired of the Holy Spirit, where he talked about being in all good conscience. 
And then he talks about the persecution that uh, Saul laid down while he was still an unbeliever, and he thinks that makes a difference. Well, Paul had a good conscience. Don't you know that you can be honestly wrong? Some people aren't honestly wrong because they have seen the evidence, they know the evidence, but they kept their error, and when keeping their error, they gave up their honesty and embraced the error, and they lost their honesty. And so no amount of evidence can ever be produced that will change a person like that. Go read about Pharaoh. Now, he noticed that if living the Christian life, or I will say if living the Christian life and you sin, if living the Christian life and you sin, you better have a good conscience because part of being a Christian is having a good conscience. And that's one of the ways we continue to live right is when in the light of God's truth, our conscience is so tender that when we see we violate one of God's laws, we change. And so it is that it's obvious the man had a good conscience because he thought he was following what was God's will. But when confronted with the truth of the living God, he reasoned according to truth gave to him, given to him, and he was able then, of course, to keep his honesty, give up his error, and embrace the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and belief and obedience to him. Have you noticed that he places me in the position of Saul of Tarsus and he in the position of Stephen? That's convenient. He places himself in the place of Stephen. Well, I suggest to you that truth will determine, truth as it is in God's Word, that you can read and study and understand by the rational powers God gave you and be convicted by the power of God's mind in His words as to who just is in the place of Paul this evening and in the place, as he was Saul of Tarsus, and in the place of Stephen. I don't know what he thinks he's found when it comes down to baptizing Campbell. I'd baptize Campbell on the same basis that I'd baptize anybody. That's what I told him the other night. And again, I hasten to say for the umpteenth time, and that simply means I don't know how many times I've said it, that these folks in coming out of errors such as his were at different places, at different ideas and views. And you can find in their lives many things that are contrary to the truth. He wants to talk about Isaiah 55, 11. I talked about that last night. Did you notice how conveniently he left off 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and he's left that completely undone and run away from it and dropped it and never even reached for it? It's worse than a hot potato to him. I suggest to you Isaiah 55, 11 does not contradict 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete. That's the design and purpose of the Word. That's what we proved on Monday and Tuesday evenings. Now, he can't set it aside, and therefore it's in harmony with what God through the prophet Isaiah was saying. Now, you notice he won't go back to Isaiah when Isaiah started talking to these sinful people, when he talked about the matter of Isaiah 1 and verse 18. This is the same Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 11, the same Isaiah in Isaiah 1, 18 that said, Come, let us reason together. He doesn't like that. But nevertheless, God said to the sinful Jews, Come, let us reason together. They didn't like that at all. Well, he just happened not to like it. He's the unctioned one. Now, you go on down to 1 John 2, 20 and 27. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. He doesn't like that at all. He doesn't like it one little bit. But I suggest to you that he has the obligation, having that kind of anointing, to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Well, he can't remember it himself. But the Holy Spirit's in him. He said it was there to help his infirmities, and my, if anybody ever needed infirmities help, he does. And so I suggest to you that we keep that in mind. Why don't you like these things? Why don't you like them? I didn't force you. No member of the Church of Christ forced you to write what you wrote in The Killing Effects of Calvinism. You wrote it on the basis of your own mind and your own thinking. And that anointed mind with the Holy Spirit that you said last night nudged you. What nudged you when you wrote that? And so that's the point we need to keep in mind. Now he talks about what do you pray for if you only believe that it's by some sort of uh, word-only thing as he wants to corrupt the view that we set out. Do you ever notice in the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, our Lord giving us by inspiration the model prayer? And in the model prayer in Matthew 6, 11, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. I pray for that. But Mr. Ross, I never did believe that a loaf of bread was going to fall out of heaven on my head. I believed that I was going to have to go out and do what was necessary 
to be able to have bread put on my table. But I didn't, when I did that, do what Jimmy Stewart said a long time ago in the Shenandoah movie, Lord, we did this and we did this and we did this and we thank you anyway. That's his view of it. If it doesn't come by a miracle, and he likes little miracles, or big miracles, little miracles, why don't you go ahead and take that Holy Spirit and raise somebody from the dead? Now I know who he's running with. Now I know who he's running with. What does that say about him? He'll take his miracles in small doses. That's what it says about him. I suggest to you that just won't work, and it won't do at all, and it won't wash. He talks about all these people who have departed from the faith or are departing from the faith. He may have a bigger list tomorrow. That's always been the case. Read your New Testament. Go back and read the Old Testament. Go all the, back, all the way back to Genesis 6. Well, now, if he had been there, he'd been off over there laughing at Noah building the ark. But he would have drowned in the flood because I suggest to you the ark was big enough to save all those who would hear the word of the living God and do just what it said. And that's exactly what happened. And the ark of safety today is big enough to take care of all those who will humbly hear, believe, and obey the truth of Jesus Christ. You accomplish nothing, Mr. Ross, to list all these folks that have departed from the truth. That's always been the case. It's nothing new to us. We're sorry about it, but it's all a process that goes along with living in this world where the devil is our adversary, going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It just simply means that we must be more determined to do what's right. At least we don't teach a doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy that says you have to run right along with the devil, but it doesn't make any difference anyway. Now, that's just a bunch of malarkey. And it's just too bad that we've had to deal with all this kind of thing this week. But that's the way he operates, and I don't anticipate any different through the rest of the night. After the first night, really before we ever got to the first, my first affirmative speech, I knew what was going to happen because of what he put down 30 minutes and gave to me in those questions. It all started off on what somebody did a long time ago. Well, I have said it, and I'll say it again for emphasis. It makes not one whit of difference, whether it was Spurgeon or whether it was Campbell or Barton Stone or the Pope of Rome. What they believed or practiced doesn't make a difference as to binding on us today. You've got to go to the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the seed of the kingdom, Mr. Ross. That's the only way you know whether you're right or I'm right. Now, honestly, honestly, what difference does it make what Campbell taught or did or didn't do? Why do you think I'm compelled to defend them? I'm just not compelled to defend them, will not defend them, except wherein they taught the truth, and I'll defend you in that. I'll defend either one of you in it or anybody else here. And I don't know all these folks, but if you can come to me with the Bible open and prove to me from this book and this book alone what's right, then we stand together. Now, there's the plea of the churches of Christ, those who are faithful. It always has been the plea. Come, let us reason together. What was God saying from Isaiah or through Isaiah to those Jews? Why, he was saying, here's the standard. You don't know how to direct yourself. I've given you way in my revelation. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And we can all unite on that. Now let's go quickly to his questions. True or false? It's reasonable to depend on revelation rather than Thomas Warren's writings on quote logic unquote and quote law of rationality unquote. I put true and I made this comment. Logic and law of rationality these did not originate with Warren, but with God. And we simply identify them with those terms just like language has been identified and categorized so we can study it and know what a verb is or what a noun is. Now, Brother Warren's done a great deal of work in that. But I told him last evening, so have a lot of other folks, even in the Baptist church. And when it comes down to the laws of logic and the law of rationality, which all the law of rationality is, it's just a way of saying we ought to justify what we conclude on the basis of adequate evidence. Now, isn't that a big thing? That's all it is. We must keep that in mind. He talks about Tom Warren. This is his second one. Tom Warren's a spiritual mastermind who um, uh, preaches truth only. Then he cites where it comes from, and I haven't read that and don't know anything about it, just saw it this evening. I didn't answer true or false for the simple reason, what does he mean by spiritual mastermind? Does he know exactly what this fellow meant? If he does, please tell us. Now, he has the unction and the anointing. There's your spiritual mastermind. There he is. There's the spiritual mastermind. He's got in his mind the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can think about that. First John 2 and verse 27. Now, 
Number three, David Brown cannot produce documentation written or all that Bob Ross teaches that the Holy Spirit personally contacts the heart of man without any medium whatsoever in the work of regeneration. I have already been dealing with this. Do you know everything that's ever been taught has been done explicitly, implicitly, or both, and there is no other way to state it? And we have shown, as we will show even this evening, that very point. I'll come back to that in just a moment as time allows. Four, David Brown rejects the quote experience unquote of salvation claimed by Alexander Campbell, and he tells where it's from, which took place before Campbell came to America and before he was baptized by a Baptist in 1812. If he'd been a Roman Catholic prelate, I would say, I do reject it. Boy, that's a big thing. What does he prove when he says that? David Brown rejects the experience, in quotes, of special calling, in quotes, to salvation claimed by Thomas Campbell before he came to America and before he was baptized in 1812. I reject them before they did what they did or any time that they were in error. Just like I reject these folks who have left the faith and gone away from it, though they once believed and practiced it. I say true. What is a big deal about that? Then the last one, number six. David Brown believes that men such as the Campbells restored the church of Christ, in quotes, and he has restored, in quotes, and underlined, without ever being, quote, baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. That's not precisely stated for the simple reason that some men were baptized for the remission of sins. And they were involved in that same thing, too. I don't know what the deal is. Do you believe that you can take truth wherever people find it and build upon that truth and benefit from that truth, though they would not conclude as much as you have concluded? Why, that's what we all try to do. I just don't understand this. Well, he's done just exactly what we thought he'd do, and as time will allow, I'm going to move on very fast. Mr. Ross, according to chart TH3, TH3, the source, he says, the source, efficient cause, direct cause, is the Holy Spirit based upon the Greek preposition ek. Now, that's what he says, based upon the Greek preposition ek. He also states this on page 19 in his book, Killing Effects of Calvinism, and there he's stating it by quoting the Puritan Stephen Carnock. You also, Mr. Ross, cite this in August, uh, Augustus H. Strong in your pamphlet, uh, Regeneration Strong versus Burkhoff. And there he says on page 8, and that's unnumbered, by the way, but it is where eight falls, that, quote, the soul, S-O-L-E, soul, quote, efficient, unquote, cause, is the Spirit of God. Now, please note my chart number 50, please. My chart number 50. Now, he has an unction from the Holy Spirit. Peter was an apostle of Christ, miraculously guided by the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of God, and he wrote by inspiration when he wrote 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Now notice what's said. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now Mr. Ross says that the Greek preposition ek is only used when he's talking about the Holy Spirit's work on us. But the Holy Spirit had his ambassador Peter employ the Greek word ek when he's talking about the word of God. You ought to do your research a little more and quit copying down what somebody else wrote and going that route. In fact, you need to stop listening to men and read your Bible. That would help a whole lot. You wouldn't make such profound messages like this. Now, notice that we have some more along this line. That is the efficient cause and the instrumental cause. Ross says, from Campbellism, its histories and heresies, this is chart 42, page 154, quote, the Spirit is the efficient cause of our birth and the Word of God is the instrumental cause. Webster says efficient being or involving the immediate agent in producing an effect. Instrumental means serving as a means, agent, or tool. Now here's Ross, and we'll use his word. Here's Ross in conjunction, in conjunction with Webster. Here's what it would come down to. The Spirit directly, directly, and immediately, that is without means, causes our birth. And the Word of God is the tool, that is with means, of causing our birth. Therefore, per him, we must conclude the Spirit causes the new birth, one, without means, and two, with means. Now, there's your proof, Mr. Ross. Now, I want to show you something. We used my pen last night. We're going to use this hour tonight. This is the Holy Spirit I'm taking off, according to the Calvinism view of the Holy Spirit. There it is right there. Now, he says the Word by itself can't do anything. Just won't go in it. Just won't go in. But he says, now you've got to have the Spirit, and he shook last night on it, when he agreed with me on this, the Holy Spirit with the Word will penetrate. But guess what? 
Before that word gets in there, represented by the shaft, the Holy Spirit directly and by himself must enter in, Mr. Ross, and that's ungetoverable. And that's where you're in link with those you call your weaker brethren, brethren, the primitive Baptists. And this is what this book is supposed to talk about. Back when you're with them, talking to them, refuting them, you sound like us. And when you're talking to us, you sound like them. Now, you said I didn't prove that. There it is, just as plain as it can be. And I suggest to you that you keep that in mind. Now, the characteristics of the Word of God through which the Holy Spirit operates, one, the Word is that which furnishes the man of God completely. We've noticed that, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Word is that which enlightens man's soul, Psalm 19, 8. The Word makes one wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3, 15. The Word is perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19, 7. The soul is begotten by the seed, the Word of truth, 1 Peter 1, 22, 23, 1 John 5, 6. The Word produces faith in the heart, Romans 10 and verse 17. I ask you, can the Holy Spirit do more separate and apart from the Word than that? I think not. The power of the Spirit is in the Word. It's just that plain and simple. Now, I want to emphasize very plainly another thing just right here before I close, if I can have this brought up here. He made a presentation to me the other night. I want to make a presentation to him tonight, and it is a memento of this debate. It is, in fact, Mr. Ross, that which will stand as an example of your kind of arrow when it comes down to the power that exists in the Calvinistic Bible. <clears throat> there it is. Dull as I don't know what, but it'll stand for a long time like that, and you can use it for other things, and that'll be about as good as Calvinistic Word of God. <laughs> now, that ought to do very well with this whole thing. Have a little fun won't hurt. But that illustrates perfectly his idea of the Word without the Holy Spirit as the point it can't penetrate the darkened understanding. It just can't do it any way under the sun. But the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, has the power and the thoughts of God in it, and it is in the whole thing. Now, Hebrews 4.12 still reads that the Word of God is quick and powerful, active and alive sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what we're saying this evening, and we're not going to let this thing come down anymore on this matter. Now, I think I have time to mention a little more what I said I would get to regarding this business of his, well, what he doesn't like, of his illumination. He runs from that like a scared cat from a mad dog. I want you to notice 1 John 2, 27. It's going to come up all through this time. And you notice that thing still hasn't penetrated that table. It's just stuck on it with a big suction. John wrote, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. That's the way he acts, but he doesn't have much to offer. But as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. 1 John 2, 27. I remind you again that in verse uh, 20, that it was John who said, Ye have an unction or anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now he gets up here and says, I want to claim this, I want to claim this, but I do not want to follow just exactly what it says. Well, then give it all up. You're going to pick and choose? And this is the miraculous gift of knowledge of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. We pointed that out some time ago. Is Mr. Ross going to claim the other miraculous gifts? Why not? You're going to claim one, you're going to claim them all. Word of wisdom, miraculous faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Mr. Ross, are you actually telling us that you know all things, and do you believe other people can have one of these who are in your position? Now, I just don't understand that whatsoever. We have more to say along this line just a little later on, but right now we ask you to give ear to Mr. Ross. Thank you very much. David has been referring to this book throughout the debate. My only regret is that David just doesn't read, you know, use his time reading the booklet because that way we wouldn't be having this dispute and I would be occupying both speeches and you would be hearing the truth both times, wouldn't you? Well, now, he's quoted from it and I've got some more out there tonight. People took them all last night and if you didn't get one last night, pick it up and if you did get one last night, well, leave those out there for others who are here tonight who may not have gotten it. And I recommend this author here, Bobby L. Ross, and I recommend The Killing Effects of Calvinism here. 
And uh, David Brown, he's over here. He's recommending it and pushing it too. Now, if you want a if you want a booklet that'll show you the errors either way, uh, you know it'll expose it or else confirm it or whatever. Why, well, I have his testimony here that it'll do the job for you. Now, uh, on his chart 42 on the efficient cause and instrumental cause, all I'm going to say about that is this: the part of this chart that is rational and logical and reasonable is the lines he quotes under Ross says. Now, when he takes Webster into the picture and goes on down and mixes Ross with Webster and then comes down to the Brown conclusion, now that's what you have a classic illustration of a Warrenism, which is confused logic and confused rationality and absolute foolishness. So I recommend the first third of this page and the rest of it, if you can figure it out, it just means you've been reading Tom Warren and his writings. Now the Holy Spirit versus Ross, 1 Peter 1, 23, chart 50. If you notice there, he put the word ek over the word of. David, why didn't you put the word, the Greek word over that other of? Notice the other of, ladies and gentlemen. Mark, hand me that ruler sitting right there behind you, please. He put the word ek over corruptible seed, which is true. But now corruptible seed is not a reference to the word, is it? The corruptible seed is not the word of God, is it? All right, but over here, but of, he didn't put anything over that which refers to the incorruptible seed, did he? You know why? Because this is not the word ek. When he refers to the incorruptible seed, it's not the word ek, but he uses the word by. And David, why didn't you put the word over by here? It's the word dia, which I contend through the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So see, do you see how he's trying to confuse the issue? He's trying to say this ek here, out of, refers to the Word of God. It refers to corruptible seed right here, David. Not born out of corruptible seed, but you're born of incorruptible by the Word of God. Put my chart up there, please, on the uh, chart he was commenting upon which is the chart number TH3, and we'll just go through this and show you the truth on this. You think I didn't study this before I put that out into print? I got better sense than that. Now, these are the causes of the new birth. The efficient cause, that's the source. The instrumental cause, that's the means. Now, when he comes up here and talks all about Ross, doesn't believe in any means, he believes in a direct operation, and he believes in a penetration without any use of means and all that. He's just beating his lips. Now, David, I brought a tape here tonight that if you really want to debate a man who believes the doctrine you're trying to pin on me, and you want to refute somebody who believes that doctrine, and he'll stand up here and tell you he believes that you're born again without the Word of God, here's the man, Eddie Garrett, Eddie Garrett out of Ohio, and this is the tape. And you know what the subject over here is? He's preaching against Bob Ross. He calls it the gospel and a reply to Bob Ross. And what's he refuting? The doctrine I'm teaching right here in this debate on the new birth that the Holy Spirit uses means, the Word of God, to convert men to Christ. And who is Eddie Garrett? He's a primitive Baptist, hard-shell preacher, publishes a magazine called the Hard-Shell Baptist. Now, if you want to debate somebody on that subject and these arguments that you've been using against me, you can apply them to Mr. Garrett. But you see, Mr. Garrett takes the same position you do concerning the new birth. Now, David, for instance, he rejects the idea (coughs) that men who are dead in sin can be called by the power of God through the gospel because David says they're not dead. Now, Mr. Garrett, on the other hand, He says they're so dead that it's no good to preach the gospel to them because they can't hear it. So he and David, both of them, take the human logic route. And I take the route that Ezekiel took in Ezekiel uh, chapter, uh, (coughs) uh, what is that, chapter 37, I believe it is. Had a note here on that. uh, Chapter 37 about the dry bones. Now, there was this valley of dry bones, and this is an instance of how God's power accompanies the Word. Ezekiel was asked, Can these bones live? He said, Lord, thou knowest. 
And so God told Ezekiel to preach to these dry bones, which are representative, they said, of the house of Israel. And then what happened? Well, these dry bones, did they have any ears to hear? They were dead. They were dry bones. But Ezekiel went out there and preached the word of God to them. And what happened? You can read it for yourself tonight when you go home. Ezekiel 37, how the power of God accompanied that preaching and he brought to pass the life of these bones. He brought them to life and they became an army. Now, friends, if I was going to look at that with rational rationality and reason, I'd say these bones can't live. Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest if they can live. But Mr. Gary and Mr. Brown both share the same logic, and I'd like to hear them debate. I'd like to see which one got the best of it in the battle of the rational thinkers. Mr. Garrett and Mr. Brown, down on the level of the, ra the rational mind, see which one's the best. Now, if he wants to debate a man, there he is right there. He's a hard-shell Baptist, believes this stuff. But Ross believes that you're born out of the Spirit as a source. And Ross believes you're born by means or through means, dia, by or with the Word, by the Word, with the Word, the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. No New Testament writer ever tries to explain the unseen internal operation of the Spirit no more than Ezekiel knew anything about what God was going to do with those dry bones. You think we understand the secret power of God? We don't understand even the, the creation. And as a matter of fact, you don't even understand the birth of a child despite all of our science and studies we've done along that. No man understands the origins of life. Uh, Jesus did not explain the new birth himself in John chapter 3, verse 8, the internality of it I'm talking about. God did not explain many secret things or the things that you and I can't see. He simply states their reality. It says the secret things belong to God, the things that are revealed belong to you. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, Proverbs 25, 2 and 33, 6. Now let's go to my next chart along this line, uh, the one on Born of the Spirit, TH4. Now here we have the teaching of the Word of God on this matter. Uh, you're born of the Spirit, John chapter 3. We're born from above. This indicates the source, God. We're born of water and Spirit. Born ek water, chi Spirit. That is, out of water, even Spirit. These words may read, born of water, even Spirit. Chi often means even, or that is to say, or by this reference, is to, this is the ex epexegetic or explanatory use. Water symbolizes spirit, according to John 7:39. Now let me say this. Nowhere in all the Bible can he find water as a symbol of baptism. And even if he could, he could not use John chapter 3 to support his doctrine because this was before the day of Pentecost and his doctrine did not come into existence till the day of Pentecost, so Jesus was not would have been preaching a doctrine to Nicodemus that had not come into effect and rebuking him for not knowing about it. Now, look here. Ek means out of and is used but once in the verse, indicating only one source and one birth. The spiritual birth is always attributed to God as the source by use of the word ek, out of God. John 3, 5, ek, water, even spirit. Of ek, God, John 1, 13. John 3, 6, of the Spirit. John 3, 8, of the Spirit. 1 John 2, 29, of Him. 3, 9, of God. 3, 9, of God. 1 John 4, 7, of God. 1 John 5, 1, of God. 1 John 5, 1, of Him. 1 John 5, 4, of God. 1 John 5, 18, of God. 1 John 5, 18, of God. Out of God. In cases of instrumentality, the preposition dia in the Greek, by or through, is used as in 1 Peter 1.23, 1 Corinthians 1.14, uh, through the gospel, by the word. Nowhere in the Bible is water defined as referring to baptism. Nowhere is one said to be born at baptism, which is his doctrine. He teaches you're not born out of God, you're born out of baptism. That's his doctrine. Born of water as the mother. I quoted you the Christian Worker magazine, which he claimed at first he didn't know about. And then I got the magazine out here and had to teach him out of his own magazine that the water's the mother. And now he knows it. 
Look here. Nowhere is one said to be born at baptism. Nowhere is baptism referred to as a birth. Rather, it's compared to a death. And I throw this in to show you the alternative doctrine is no, it's not true and that this is the true doctrine we're born out of God. All right. Thank you. So that takes care of his little chart on uh, 1 Peter 1.23, and I'd like to see him address that. Now give me chart number uh, CW1, I believe it is. We want to get this in before the last speech. I want him to have a chance to chew on this. Uh, I always like to throw these bones out to these brethren and let them chew on them. Christian worker and spiritual sword versus David Brown. Now, someone's going to say, well, Mr. Ross... I get so tired of you quoting that. I get so tired of Campbell and Christian workers and spiritual swords and Thomas Warren. Well, let me read you from the spiritual sword, if I may. You know, this is an encyclopedia of Bible doctrine. He told about Tom Warren. Tom Warren in his magazine said that spiritual sword is an encyclopedia of Bible doctrine. Now, that's something, isn't it? Now, look at here. Here's what they say. And this is issue of April 1981. And I read this stuff because I get more ammunition out of this than I could ever get, uh, you know, from some other place. I mean, these guys just keep me... I just can't hardly keep up with all the material I can get to use against them. says, so, listen, it is necessary to examine the early history of the movement in order to see its full impact. And he's talking about the Pentecostal movement. Now, if it's necessary to do that with Pentecostals, what about the Restoration Movement? If a doctrine was not revealed or even fully revealed in 1913, it's obvious it did not originate in the Bible. And he talks about this restoration movement, you know, struggling along and, and putting away a little heresy here and a little heresy there, and finally they get on up here till they were the restored movement. Well, here he says if it's not fully revealed until 1913, he can't even put his finger on the date when it, his restoration movement came to fruition. The fact that men may now seek to defend it by the Scriptures does not make it a scriptural doctrine, and that's what I want to bear down on. The fact that you now come here and try to quote the Bible to me to justify something does not make it a scriptural doctrine no more than made Pentecostalism a scriptural doctrine when they come quoting you the Bible and they originated in 1913, and he can't justify the Restoration Movement which originated with the Campbells no more than the Pentecostals can do theirs. And if they can use history against the Pentecostals, I can use the history, beloved, against them. And, that's, and every time they put that Alexander Campbell name in that Christian Worker magazine, every time they put that Restoration Movement name in that magazine, just let them know Bob Ross is going to pick that up, stick it in his files, and somewhere down the line they may have to eat it like a bone. All right, now, look here. Christian Worker, Spiritual Sword versus David Brown on Alexander Campbell. Bill Jackson said in a TV program, which I've got on tape, Campbell caused men to obey the truth. Christian Worker Magazine, David, uh, associate editor over here, Campbell gives exhaustive and definitive biblical teaching on the work of the Holy Spirit. 588, page 1. Spiritual sword, Garland Elkins. Campbell was one of the restorers of the gospel, the church, baptism, and worship. David said, what does it matter? If Alexander Campbell had never been born, the other night he said, if Campbell had never lived, what difference would it make? Well, David, here's the difference. Those men that Campbell caused to obey the truth, according to Bill Jackson, they never would have obeyed it, would they? And all this exhaustive, definitive, biblical teaching on the work of the Holy Spirit, which you've been spouting off up here for three nights, that never would have come your way, so you'd have something to debate about. And you and I wouldn't even be here within this debate tonight, would it, if Alexander Campbell had never been born, never lived. Now Garland Elkins said Campbell restored the gospel, the church, baptism, and worship. There wouldn't even be a church of Christ over here for us to debate in it if these men hadn't come along, David. That's what Garland Elkins said, and you're his close buddy. I got a paper here you wrote about him uh, in the spiritual sword. You said that uh, him and Tom Warren, that, you know, they just preached the truth of the gospel. I've got the quote over there, preach the truth. Now, the Christian Worker magazine, which he helps to edit, said the Campbell-Rice debate ought to be read once a year. That's October 1989, issue, page 6. Now, look at David Brown, though. He comes in a debate, and what does he say? One is not going to learn to go to heaven by studying Alexander Campbell. Bill Jackson seemed to think so. Bill Jackson said, Campbell, Campbell, 
cause men to obey the truth. David Brown doesn't believe that. He said you can't learn to go to heaven by studying Alexander Campbell. Then he said, if Campbell had never lived, what difference would it make? Well, right here you have it, these men over here telling you, and he's a part of the whole shebang, but see, when you get their nose to the grindstone and ask them about Campbell and his baptism, he said, well, now he would baptize Campbell on the same basis that he would baptize Ross, if I got his quote right there. He said, Brown would baptize Alexander on the same basis he would baptize Ross or others. Well, now listen, he'd have a hard time baptizing Alexander Campbell just about as hard time as he'd have baptizing me because Alexander Campbell was satisfied with the baptism he got from a Baptist preacher, and I am too. So now how are you going to baptize either one of us? He's not going to baptize either one of us. Is he? he said, oh, 2 Timothy 3.16, well, what's 2 Timothy 3.16? Simply talking about the Word is the means. And what does that Word teach us? It teaches us that the power of God accompanies the Word. It teaches us that we're born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Timothy 3.16 doesn't rule out the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. 2 Timothy 3.16 was given by the Holy Spirit. Well, my goodness alive, you wouldn't even have that verse if it hadn't been for the Holy Spirit doing some kind of what you call a direct operation on the writer. And what Mr. Fire said in the little magazine I brought up here, it was a spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication, he said, that was made to the Apostle Paul. And you don't, I doubt you even believe in the direct operation of the Spirit when he inspired the Bible, do you? You like that term, direct operation. I never use it myself. I just preach the Word of God. The Gospel is the means and leave the Spirit of God to do His work in whatever way He does it because I can't explain the Holy Spirit. You know, they teach you that you don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit by any empirical evidence, so how am I going to explain Him? All I know about Him is what I read in this Bible. This Bible says that He convicts men. This Bible says that He blesses His Word. It's a powerful thing. It's a sharper than any two-edged sword because... Oh, wait a minute. Didn't he say something like this? He said, The power of the Spirit is in the Word. Praise God. We finally got his foot in his mouth. We finally got his foot in his mouth. Monday night, I believe it was, or Tuesday, he said the Spirit was not in the Word, and now tonight he's put his foot into his mouth and turned it sideways, and he said, The power of the Spirit is in the Word. Well, after all, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we're concerned about, isn't it? I mean, if we've got a spirit in there that doesn't have any power, what good's that spirit going to do? So, David, we'll take it. We'll, we'll take it that much uh, that you're going to give it, that the power of the spirit is in the Word of God. I think we have accomplished something here tonight to get him to make that concession. Now, I'm, I appreciate his... Huh? I appreciate his plunger over here, and I tell you what I'm going to do, David. Next time I have a debate, I'm going to take that plunger with me, and, and I'm going to uh, use it in that debate and see if I can uh, do any better job in that debate than you've done in this debate, you, because it didn't look to me like that you, might, you knew much about handling the plunger. And so I'll do that. Uh, he said he prayed for bread, then he went out and done what's necessary. That's all we're saying. You pray to God... And then you use the means. And what are those means? The Word of God. But are the, is the bread going to come if God doesn't bless it? If God doesn't send the rain? If God doesn't send the sunshine? Is He going to have a crop? No, sir. And the Word is not going to have a crop either unless that power that's in that Word, the Holy Spirit's power, does its part in causing it to be effectual unto that which God has ordained it. Thank you. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.